Hello, it's Scott Manley here. On August 26th, 1998, the maiden flight of the first Delta III lifted off from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, carrying the Galaxy 10, destined for geostationary orbit. This was a big step up for Delta. The reliable Delta II rocket was smaller and it lacked a high-performance upper stage. The new Delta III had a completely new Delta cryogenic second stage, which allowed it to place up to 3.8 tons into geostationary orbit, twice that of its predecessors. Delta II had been such a reliable launch vehicle that customers had been willing to place actual satellites on the very first launch. The launch had originally been targeted for July, however it had been delayed due to issues related to pyro testing. But when the time finally came and the engines lit, the 460 tonnes of thrust from the nine solid rocket motors and the single RS-27A main engine sent the 300 tonne vehicle skyward. As it raced through the night sky, it turned out over the Atlantic. It made it through max Q, and as the first stage boosters were nearing burnout, while the vehicle was 20 kilometers up and moving at about 1100 meters per second, suddenly it turned sideways and the aerodynamic forces tore the vehicle apart. The flight termination system was activated and the customer watched as their satellite fell into the ocean, accompanied by a rain of flaming debris. So, how did this happen? Well, to understand this, we actually have to go back and look at the Delta III's heritage. The Delta II was developed by McDonnell Douglas in the late 1980s for the US Air Force's medium launch vehicle program. It was the latest iteration in a long line of Delta rockets, which were all ultimately derived from the Thor Intermediate Range Ballistic Missile. Now, the Thor didn't have the range needed to hit targets when it was launched from within the US. So it had been designed to be loaded onto transportation aircraft and carried to the UK where it would be actually deployed. That meant the core stage was only 2.4 metres in diameter and all the iterations of the Delta had kept this tank size, albeit stretched and with upgraded engines and radially mounted solid rocket motors. To handle new payloads, the Delta III needed a wider fairing and more lift capability. But efforts were made by McDonnell Douglas to reuse as much of the Delta II hardware and facilities as possible. The base of the rocket used the same RS-27A engine attached to the same 2.4 metre wide liquid oxygen tank. But the fuel tank that sat on top of it was replaced with a shorter, fatter version that was 4 metres wide. That shortened the first stage significantly and it made room for a much larger second stage. The new Delta Cryogenic second stage was powered by an RL-10 engine burning hydrogen and oxygen. It had a dry mass of 2.5 tonnes and a wet mass of 19 tonnes. On top of this, there was a 4 meter fairing able to accommodate the new generation of larger satellites. The shorter fuel tank and the longer second stage sort of cancelled each other out to make a rocket which was roughly the same height and footprint of the Delta II, so existing launch and processing facilities didn't need huge changes. Finally, there were nine solid rocket motors arranged around the core. These were larger Gem 46 variants to provide more burn time over those on the Delta II, and like the Delta II, only six of those would be lit at launch with the remaining three being activated at the burnout and staging of the initial six. The three that were lit higher up had larger, longer nozzles to account for the lower atmospheric pressure. Due to the extra mass of the launch vehicle, three of the first six boosters were also equipped with gimballing nozzles, which would provide extra control authority during the early portion of the launch. The hydraulically driven nozzles could adjust their angle by about plus or minus five degrees. And I should also mention that between the initial development of the Delta III and the first flight, McDonnell Douglas was essentially acquired by Boeing. This didn't have any direct bearing on the incident, but it does mean that a lot of the post-flight reporting and news reported the Delta III builder as Boeing. Another piece of hardware shared between the Delta generations was the redundant in-flight control assembly, or RIFCA a highly reliable guidance computer with six gyroscopes, six accelerometers, and three computers, ensuring redundancy so that any single failure could not doom the launch. 
The control systems take the desired flight path, they use data from the gyroscopes and accelerometers to determine the vehicle's actual location, orientation and velocity, and then it determines the adjustments needed and sends signals to the engines, to the actuators to control everything. It's complicated, but the easy way to think about it is if you're driving a car down the road and you're wanting to stay in the lane, if you're too far to the left, you turn a little to the right and vice versa. Now, that might seem easy conceptually, but try writing down optimal equations for controlling the steering wheel or just watch a student driver try to stay in lane. They sort of wobble about as they're learning how the car drives and responds to their control inputs. As the flight progressed, the guidance system would regularly update the weights and the gains used for its guidance equations as the vehicle mass and dynamics changed. Around 50 seconds into the flight, a new set of numbers went in and they weren't quite right for the flight regime. A roll developed and as the system tried to correct the roll, it turned it into an oscillation, which was amp being amplified by the actions of the control system instead of being suppressed. The new solid rocket motors with their gimballing nozzles gave the Delta III much more roll control than the Delta II did, which only had an RS-27A engine. Uh, and this meant that as it tried to roll towards its neutral position, it would inevitably overshoot and then have to correct backwards. So it's not just that the Delta III had more roll control, it had too much roll control for the guidance algorithms which were loaded on board. Within seconds, it was rolling back and forth about four times per second, just like that student driver weaving around in their lane. The nozzles were being moved back and forth to try and correct this, driven by the hydraulic system built into each booster. Now, the boosters were only designed to be used for 75 seconds, so that hydraulic system was only designed with the endurance needed for that flight profile. The excessive steering commands were slamming the nozzles from one extreme to another very rapidly. And this ended up using all the hydraulic fluid pressure in the system very quickly. At about 65 seconds, the nozzles all stuck in their various positions and that left the core RS-27A main engine to fight the force of these askew nozzles. Over the next few seconds, the vehicle slowly lost control pitched over and was lost. Later investigation showed that the role mode which had challenged the control system had been one of many identified by the designers during the development. However, experience with the Delta II had suggested that the most significant oscillation modes at liftoff remained those. And so they only accounted for the ones that were seen at liftoff and the four hertz roll wasn't seen at liftoff. But on the Delta III, this wasn't the case, and the 4 hertz resonance kicked in later on in flight, and it became significant enough to destroy the vehicle. And so the first Delta III failed due to lack of full dynamics simulation and analysis before flight. The second Delta III would also fail, but it wasn't the fault of the Delta III designers. Instead, the normally reliable RL-10 engine ruptured its combustion chamber seconds into the GTO injection burn. The third Delta III was in fact a success, but it was to be the last flight of the Delta III. Boeing had already started work on the Delta IV, which would take the new DCSS upper stage and its fairing, but instead it would replace the booster with an entirely new hydrogen-propelled system powered by the RS-68 engine. The Delta II would also take the larger solid rocket motors from the Delta III to make the Delta IIH, or heavy. That gave the Delta II a little performance boost that was needed for some payloads. It's kind of sad because for many the Delta III was the last real iteration of the Delta, featuring the 2.4 meter core that had direct lineage back to the Thor rocket of the 1950s. But the Delta II did continue to fly until last year. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.